Thank you for attending today. I will be your um, host, felicitator for our presentation today. Um, just really quick, uh, next slide, please. All right. So before we get started, we have some housekeeping. Um, video off, please, and mute your microphone. Um, once you're done with that, if you can, please enter your information in the chat on the side. Uh, enter your name, your role, and what organization you are with in the chat. All right. Okay, uh, next slide, please. All right. So today we're talking about Project ECHO, which collects uh, registration, participation, questions, answers, chat comments, and poll responses for some tele-ECHO programs. Your individual data will be kept confidential. These data may be used for reports, maps, communication, surveys, quality insurance, evaluations, research, and to inform new initiatives. The ECHO session will be recorded, um, both video and audio, your participation confirms your consent to this recording. Recordings will be used for prog program quality improvement and potentially future training opportunities. If you are participating via audio slash phone only, please announce your name and location and put that information into the chat. Ooh, good job. Thank you, everybody. I see it lighting up in the chat box there. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so please note that only the introduction and the lecture, lecture portions of this presentation will be recorded for educational and quality improvement purposes. No PHI, protected health information, is to be disclosed. All patient information related to the case discussion will be de-identified for presentation during this ECHO session, and only case ID number, ECHO ID, will be used. Please do not share any protective health information, PHI, during the ECHO session. All right, uh, next slide, please. All right, so today, uh, here's our agenda. We did the welcome, the housekeeping. We'll move into the icebreaker, what followed up by a lecture, uh, didactic, uh, Q&A, sorry, case discussions, and then we will close out our program for today, our presentation. All right. Okay, so thank you for attending today, everybody. Uh, my name is Kyle Mitchell. Um, I am still here in Arizona, so I will say hello. Yate, she Kyle Mitchell, Yinshia, Twitter, Nishla, Nakai Bushishin, Kayani, the Shiche, Nakai, the Shinele. Um, so my name is Kyle Mitchell. I am a storyteller, an educator, and a veteran. Um, I believe that uh, storytelling has a huge power with it, and it has a power to transform, um, to shape, and to change. And so I will be your facilitator today. Um, next slide, please. All right. So we are going to talk about Nikui. Nikui is a national nonprofit organization devoted to the support and development of quality, accessible, and culturally competent health and public health services for American Indians and Alaska Natives living in urban areas. Nikui is the only national representative of the 41 Title V UIOs under the IHS and the IHCIA. Nikui strives to improve the health of over 70% of American Indian Alaska Native population that live in urban areas supported by quality accessible health care centers. Nikui strives to create uh, a broad awareness of Indian health issues while maintaining a visible presence in DC. We track legislation and provide congressional testimony as we distribute news, resource updates, and legislative alerts. We hold conferences, webinars, and hosts an interactive website that helps to disseminate information and, and felicitates partnerships. Uh, next slide, please. All right, talking a little bit about Project First Line. Project First Line is a CDC's national training and education collaborative for healthcare information for healthcare infection prevention and control. Every frontline healthcare worker deserves to understand the infection control principles and protocols 
and the CDC's Infection Control Training Collaborative. Project First Line is committed to helping every frontline healthcare worker increase their knowledge and understanding of infection control. They aim to achieve this through providing clear and effective infection control resources and CDC recommendations while also considering the needs and preferences of the healthcare workforce. Next slide, please. All right, our CDC acknowledgement. Project First Line is a national collaborative led by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, to provide infection control training and education to frontline healthcare workers and public health personnel. Nikui is proud to sponsor is proud to partner with Project First Line as supported through Cooperative Agreement CDC RFA. OT 18-1802 and CDC RFA CK202003. CDC is an agency within the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, HHS. The contents of this program do not necessarily represent the policies of CDC or HHS and should not be considered an endorsement by the federal government. Next slide, please. All right, uh, Nikui would like to thank the American Academy of Pediatrics, AAP, a Project ECHO Super Hub for providing Project ECHO training and guidance to Nikui on becoming a Project ECHO Hub. Through this platform, Nikui is able to provide Project ECHO support to urban organizations and as we disseminate Project First Line training contents and products. All right, next slide, please. All right, so here's a QR code. Uh, please take our survey at the end of this session and let us know how we can better serve you. To make it easier for you, we'll find the QR code here on your screen to the left. Um, and you can scan it at any time through your smart form, uh, smartphone, sorry, and complete that. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so we finished all of the disclaimers, all the information. Now let's get everybody moving a little bit, okay? So I have two icebreakers for us to complete within a short amount of time. So with that said, next slide, please. All right, solve this riddle. I speak without a name and hear without ears. I have no body, but I come alive with the wind. What am I? Think about it. Um, and if you think you know the answer, please go ahead and turn on your camera and your mic and let us know. I will give the group here, let's see, we'll go with 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Almost, Johnny. Oh, almost. Dion. Uh-oh. Looks like Joseph was the one to uh, crack the code. Joseph Anderson. Yes, the correct answer. Next slide, please. Oh, wait, go back one. Sorry. Oh, so the, the answer is echo. Yes, yes. So we've got some corny little dad jokes going right now, but it's okay, right? It's a little laugh. We all know echo. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so now what I want the group to do is to think about yourself. And if you could de describe yourself in one word, what would that be? I will give everybody, let's see, we'll go with, say, 20 seconds, uh, starting now. For your responses, go ahead and enter it uh, into the chat, or you can unmute your mic, uh, turn on your camera, and give out your uh, response. So, 10 more seconds. Oh, these are amazing. I love that. Detail-oriented, calming, warm, kind, Ooh, Ruby, I like that. Spitfire. Nice. Relatable. Ah, nice.
Great job. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I appreciate you uh, being awake and excited for this amazing presentation we have today. Whoops. Sorry about that. I have a timer going. Okay. All right. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so today we will be covering these objectives uh, to share the CDC Project First Line new training content and products on germ spread, body reservoirs, and how to recognize and mitigate infection risks. Provide additional training resources to UIO frontline healthcare workers for adoption and augment their training curriculum. Felicitate all teach and all learn approach using the ECHO format and encourage a community of learning among the UIOs. All right, next slide, please. All right, ladies and gentlemen and attendees, we have our first uh, presenter, Shay Drummond, uh, is Project First Line's infection control subject expert. Prior to joining Project First Line, Shay was an infection preventist quality management consultant for the VA healthcare system and has frontline nursing experience in disease surveillance, outbreak response, and public health. Uh, Shay also loves to hike. She's an avid hiker. And so with that, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Shay Drummond. Hi, good afternoon. It's, um, almost, it's almost afternoon here. I'm coming from Eugene, Oregon today. And I really appreciate everyone taking time to join this ECHO session today. And um, we'll get started. And next slide, please. So um, today, as Kyle said, we're gonna explore the body reservoirs and their role in infection control. Next slide. I do not have any financial disclosures to report this morning. Next slide. All right, so today's lecture is gonna build upon your previous ECHO presentations that you've had that covered um, breakdowns in infection control and recognizing risks in healthcare. We're gonna review those core places where the germs live in healthcare, and we're gonna be focusing on the four reservoirs in the body, and then we're gonna discuss strategies for recognizing the risks for germs to spread. We're gonna talk about the pathways and the actions. This is the important part, the actions that um, all of us and our healthcare workers that we work with can use to reduce that spread. Um, to, to tie into um, today's case study and Dr. Kwok's lecture, I'm gonna use and focus on C. difficile as our bug of the day. And I'm gonna use that to illustrate the whys behind the actions and ways to integrate Project First Line into your healthcare system um, to help you promote that culture that recognize um, that infection prevention and control is actually for all of us. Next slide. All right. As you learned in previous ECHO sessions and why we are all here gathered again today is the goal of everything we do in infection control for any disease is to keep people from getting sick. So what does risk recognition, body reservoirs and pathways have to do with infection control? Being able to spot or recognize that risk allows all of us to step in, to stop them and to prevent infections. So risk recognition is identifying that potential for a problem to happen. It doesn't mean that problem's actually going to happen, but once you can recognize any risk, you can take those actions to minimize it. So as part of my presentation today, I want to um, not only share some specific information about C. diff and the case study that you're gonna hear later on in the presentations, but I also am gonna be sharing along the way as I go, our project first line materials. Um, you have access to these online, I have a resource content slide at the end of my presentation. So I encourage everyone to um, take those resources back with you and check them out and use them. Next slide. So what is a reservoir? When we think about 
how to keep germs from spreading in the healthcare system, I think it's really helpful that we all really understand the context of where these germs live. So think about it as their home or their reservoirs. Knowing where germs um, actually live, we can then recognize that risk or where that risk may be present for them to spread. So then this will help us with our infection control actions to stop the germs from spreading and making people sick. So to get started, I actually wanna hear from you. Um, if we could use the chat, I would love if you could type in what you think a body reservoir is that you may be familiar with or body systems that you identify with that you think may most likely pose that risk to your patients in your healthcare system. So if you could go ahead and type that in the chat, that would be great. Oh, Laura, thank you. The gut, yes, ties in nicely with our C. diff. Hands, absolutely, Christine. Nares, yes. Blood, skin, mouth, skin, yes. Oh my gosh, you guys are, are hitting it. Very good. Would anyone want to unmute themselves and expand on your answers that, that you put in the chat? And um, just tell us a little bit what you thought about that reservoir that you put in the chat and what you might share if you were discussing this with a new person in your healthcare system. Anybody wanna come off mute and give a little more detail? Give it a few more seconds. I can jump on. Great, thank you. Would you like me to turn my camera on? <laughs> sure, would love to see you, thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, um, I suggested lungs uh, when I have a, a new employee coming on, if I'm referring to like TB, um, our lungs can be a reservoir for um, tuberculosis. That's in, uh, what, the hi not the hibernation stage. Um, can't even think of what it's called right now. <laughs> this is a, an excellent example. And thank you so much for um, sharing with us. And, and that's a perfect way to engage in that conversation with a staff person to start that conversation about risks and actions. Thank, Thank you. you so much. These are You're great welcome. ideas. Next slide. Okay, so reservoirs. We talked about the gut, the skin, and the respiratory and blood. There are four reservoirs, next slide please, in, can we go back one more slide please? Thank you. So there are four reservoirs in the body that are important for infection control. We have the skin, the gut, some people call it the gastrointestinal system, the respiratory system and blood. There are other areas of the body that can definitely contribute to germ spread, but we're gonna take a closer look at these four today. When we understand where these germs are found and how they can move from place to place or from reservoir to reservoir and how they can cause harm in these different areas, we can recognize when they can be spread and decide how we can protect ourselves our patients and our colleagues in our day-to-day -day work. Next slide. So the next four, four slides I have in my presentation, these are actual posters that you can go online and download from our Project First Line site. I think they're really useful resources for clinical areas, teaching. Um, so I wanted to make sure you knew that you had access to those. So there's a lot of important things about skin to remember for infection control. Germs can spread from skin, which happens a lot, mostly through our hands because we use them so much. Touch is definitely a major pathway and spread um, to and from the skin. Germs on your skin can spread to people, they can spread to surfaces, and your skin can actually pick up 
the germs also through touch and spread them to others or yourselves. We also do things in healthcare that break people's skin. So think about the insertion of an IV or treating patients with surgical procedures. When that happens, germs on our skin surfaces or your patient's surfaces can be pushed into the patient's body or bloodstream. There's some common organisms you might think of um, with skin. Ones that come to mind would be Staphylococcus aureus, including MRSA, Streptococcus, Candida aureus, um, which is less common, but is becoming more of an emerging concerning threat in healthcare. So what are some of the infection control actions that we can take um, with the skin to limit the spread? Actions for infection control could in, and should include hand hygiene, appropriate glove and PPE use, injection safety, Cleaning and disinfecting and source control all are very effective in diminishing the spread of germs when we think about um, our skin. For source control for skin, pay attention to open wounds, oozing sores, and make sure that anything that's covered, that's damaged is covered so that there's not that portal of entry for the germs to get in through the skin. Next slide. Thank you. Respiratory. We've certainly heard a lot about that through COVID. It's on everyone's mind. Um, as you all know, there are several pathways for germs to be spread from the respiratory system. Coughing, talking, sneezing, and breathing, of course, are all important pathways. We also have to remember that respiratory droplets can spread by splashes and sprays um, to the eyes, the nose, the mouth, touch again is also very important. Because germs in the respiratory system can spread easily to our skin and hands, and then again, we can spread it from there to people and surfaces. It's good to keep in mind some of the various other healthcare tasks that we engage in with our patients. Um, think about oral care, just every day, daily teeth brushing and dental procedures. Um, you may have patients that use CPAP for sleep apnea, giving nebulized medications. These are just a few of the um, healthcare techs that we engage in that could promote these pathways for spread. Organisms that you may encounter in the respiratory reservoir would include um, organisms such as Pseudomonas, Staphylococcus aureus, think about uh, MRSA and the Nares viruses like influenza, the common cold, and of course, SARS-CoV-2. Some of the necessary actions for infection control when you recognize these risks and pathways is hand hygiene, again, use of personal protective equipment. Um, it can get a little more complicated sometimes when thinking about respiratory reservoirs because there are various types and levels of face masks. Um, we have respi respirators, we have eye protection. These selections are gonna be made dependent on the organism. This is where you may want to consult the CDC resources, uh, for example, Appendix A, for further guidance and on the precautions and if there's a need for isolation for a specific organism. Source control for respiratory reservoirs includes masking as we discussed, cleaning and disinfection, and using those environmental controls to shut down the pathway and spread. Respiratory and cough etiquette, which is part of our standard precaution package. And then also we want to recognize that ventilation plays a very important role in respiratory pathways and spread in our healthcare settings. Now we'll move on to blood. Next slide. So blood, viruses like HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C can spread in healthcare. When contaminated um, blood is on a sharp item. If that item causes a break in the skin or it could be yours or a patient's, uh, think about an accidental needle stick if you're in a surgical procedure. Those germs can then spread to the person and potentially cause a new infection. Reusing needles or syringes is especially risky because blood 
can grow bacteria, become contaminated and spread from person to person. Blood in the environment can be present on linens or devices. Um, so those are other risk factors to be um, cognizant of and realize it's composed of risk for spread in a pathway. There's many healthcare um, tasks that we do, as you all know, that involve blood. So putting in an IV, giving injections, surgical procedures, even changing soil bed, linen, bed linens that are potentially contaminated with blood can be a pathway. So again, what can we do? What are those actions, those infection control actions that we can take to prevent and stop the spread or, um, on these pathways? Hand hygiene. So are you seeing a theme now by now with that hand hygiene? Um, use of personal protective equipment. So gowns, gloves, eye protection, safe injections. I can't say enough about this. Following the CDC guidelines for safe injection practices to prevent transmission of infection to patients, extremely important. And appropriate cleaning and disinfection along with our textile management. The textile management, I, I like to include this because sometimes that seems to be an afterthought in our patient care, but we need to think about these pathways starting from the moment somebody walks into our healthcare system until even long after they leave the system and go back out into the community. Next slide. All right, the gut. Germs from the gut actually travel very easily in stool, and they're unfortunately commonly found in the environment, uh, especially in surfaces of bathrooms, as you can imagine. They're easily spread by touch. This is really, as we've seen, the major pathway for, for most of these germs. Bypassing and breaking down the body's defenses is another way that they can be spread, such as through procedures that may, um, surgical procedures, for example, that may break down the gut's normal defense and spread germs to other parts of the body. It can also happen if um, germs are on someone's skin and get into the body from a procedure such as an IV insertion. There's also additional um, healthcare tasks that are routine that we do in our care for our patients, um, such as helping them toilet, changing diapers, ostomy care, bathing a patient even, and changing those laundry um, linens and taking care of um, beds and clothing that patients may be um, getting in and out of. So those are some of our routine tasks. Um, germs to think about with the gut. Clostridium C. diff, Clostridioids difficile that we're going to be spending more time later talking about. Um, e. coli, that's another one. Um, Klebsiella, those are several that you may hear of as you care for patients. So again, there's many infection control actions we can take um, to reduce the risk. Hand hygiene, use of that PPE, gown and gloves, cleaning and disinfection. Next slide, please. What is C. difficile? Clostridioids difficile, formerly known as Clostridium difficile, or as we call it in the healthcare system, C. diff, is an anaerobic gram-positive spore-forming rod that causes diarrhea and colitis and can cause serious inflammation of the colon. It's actually estimated there's almost a half a million cases each year in the United States and it can be extremely fatal. One in 11 over age 65 diagnosed with a healthcare associated infection of C. diff die within one month. Next slide. So why is C. diff so challenging in the healthcare setting? When C. diff germs are outside the body, they actually become spores. These spores are an inactive form of the germ and have a protective coating allowing them to live for months sometimes even years, in the surfaces and environment and soil. This actually can set up many pathways. Prior to joining Project First Line, I worked at the VA and my office was on the sixth floor where our GI lab was. We had a very uh, comedic gastroenterologist who 
would routinely open the door to the infection control office suite and yell in, hey, I think I see C. diff spores rolling around the hallways. Infection control, you better get out and take care of them. I'd laugh every time he would do this, but for me, it was this great visual of how hardy the C. diff spore is and how important that we understand that it takes specific actions to really eradicate and lower the um, presence of it in our healthcare environment and the pathways for spread for disease. The germs become active again when these spores are swallowed and reach our intestines. This is the pathway that nobody really ever wants to talk about, the fecal oral route of transmission. C. diff germs are carried from person to person in stool and C. diff can live on people's skin. Our hands and our healthcare workers' hands that can be transiently contaminated with C. diff spores are probably the main reason um, by which these organisms are spread throughout our healthcare system in non-outbreak times. Strict adherence to hand washing and soap and water and gloves, changing those gloves between every patient interaction are the most effective ways that we can both prevent hand contamination and germ spread. I'm gonna walk down a quick C. diff pathway. This is gonna set us up nicely for our next presentation. Patient A was admitted with severe diarrhea and tested positive for C. diff. Shift changes occurred and the ward was bustling and the incoming evening snap staff were taking vitals. The staff goes in ungloved and uses a blood pressure cuff on patient A. The germs spread to the healthcare worker's hand from patient A's hands. The healthcare worker does not clean the cuff or their own hands and exits the room and moves on to the next room, patient B, who happens to be on antibiotics. The healthcare worker takes the next patient's pulse using a pulse oximeter on their finger and spreads the germs to patient B. The healthcare worker also uses a blood pressure cuff that has not been cleaned. Right then, evening snacks are brought in, but patient B does not wash their hands or clean their hands and eats the snacks. The C. diff germs have now entered their body and infected them. Next slide. Did you recognize the risks in the pathway? There are many risks of C. diff in ways and pathways that we can be infected. Antibiotic exposure, taking antibiotics um, that can break down the gut protection and the body's natural defenses, previous C. diff infections, age, all can be contributing factors. A weakened immune system and recent hospitalizations or long-term stay can also impact and make someone more susceptible. Next slide. So what infection control actions can you take to reduce the risk? As you saw with all of our body reservoirs today that we talked about, hand hygiene is the number one action to help reduce germ spread. But C. diff being a spore forming Organism requires a different approach. You have to and should use soap and water. Why, you ask? The physical actions of washing and rinsing our hands um, is recommended because the alcohol, the chlorhexidine, iodophores, all those antiseptics that we typically use on our hands do not work to break down the spore. Instead, we need to use that physical action of hand washing and soap and rinsing those spores off down the drain. Next slide. This is from CDC guidance, and this starts to outline the potential precautions that you should consider. So you recognize the risk, it's diarrhea. You're going to start contact precautions. This is on top of the standard precautions that you already take every day in and out with all your patient care. Next slide. As I mentioned, earlier in the presentation, when you have a specific or organism and you aren't sure what precautions that you need to do, you can resource the Appendix A. Um, when you have a confirmed C. diff, you're definitely gonna wanna continue those contact precautions. For patients with confirmed CDI, you will want to also maintain those contact precautions for at least 48 hours after the diarrhea has resolved or longer, 
Um, it could be up to the duration of the hospitalization. You want to ensure that you have isolation signage also on the patient's door that is visible so people entering the room can um, be alerted and take whatever precautions that they need. Next slide. Just as C. diff requires washing with soap and water for hand hygiene, environmental cleaning and disinfection also has specific requirements. This is a very important step in breaking those pathways for transmission. And like hand hygiene, it requires a specific action in making sure that the germicide and sporicidals are from the EPA Schedule K list. You also need to understand staff need to understand the proper dwell time for the length of time of the products to remain on the surface so that that product can actually kill the C. diff spores. Next slide. Steps to success. Knowing where these germs live can help you recognize where there's risk for them to spread. It also helps you understand why infection control actions work to stop spread um, of the germs in your environment and make people sick. Recognizing the risks allows us to take actions. This action may be as simple as collaborating with your team to find out what the next steps are. We at Project First Line are here as a resource for you and are here to help. I encourage you to check out our materials, use our session plans for educational resources, and to take this material forward to engage with your healthcare workers as we all work together to keep our patients, our coworkers, and our communities healthy and safe. And thank you. And with that, I'll turn it back to Kyle for Karen's portion. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, we're going to forego the Q&A till the end just to be cognitive of everybody's time. Um, so allow me to introduce uh, Karen. Karen holds a dual master's degree in nursing and in public health and is nationally certified family nurse practitioner. She has over 20 years of experience working in health equity with uh, resilient communities, including coordinating, health, coordinating care for UIO patients, uh, specifically San Francisco, California's Native American Heart Center. Uh, please join me in welcoming up Karen. Thank you, Kyle, for that introduction. Um, in the next slide, I have no disclosures at all. In the next slide, we'll just be moving directly into our case presentation and discussion. Due to the protection of patient health information, we will cease recording now in respect to our patients and healthcare worker experience. 